I feel lucky in my life in that I have two homes. I have a home in Zimbabwe and I have a home in America. So when we get to heaven, I'm not sure which side I'll be on. Um, but I'll have lots of Zimbabweans to introduce you to. Uh, it's really, really good. This has been a short visit, unfortunately, but it's very difficult when you have a hospital to run to be away for very long. The good thing is that we now have FaceTime and internet, so we can be on the phone every day to the hospital. And they tend to call us when they get to work in the morning, which is at night, our time. So right now, during this time, our uh, Sunday night service is going on. And our Sunday night service is a really special service because we meet at the hospital so the patients can be involved. And we have all of our waiting mothers who are around 70 to 80 people come and they sing every Sunday night a special music and they dance. And they dance hard because they want to deliver their babies. <laughs> so they think the harder they dance, the, harder, the sooner the baby will come. So it's quite entertaining to come. Um, I'd like to speak this morning about being happy in bad times. And I want to read from 1 Peter, starting with chapter, uh, verse 3 and going through verse 7. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which persists even through, perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I live in a country where we suffer grief every day. A psychiatrist once said, if you live in Zimbabwe and you're not depressed at times, you are not normal. Um, we live in a country that has set many records. Unfortunately, the records are not great records that you'd want to be proud of, but we live in a country that had the highest inflation rate in the world. And we lived in a country that we got up to a $100 trillion bill in 2009. And that $100 trillion bill was worth less than $1 US. So you can imagine how many hundred trillion dollar bills you have to carry to buy anything. And we, that was after they had taken 25 zeros off the money. So I don't know what 25 plus trillion would be. We kept Googling all the time to see what our money was going to be. In, in 2016, the government in 2009, we went to the U.S. dollar, so the U.S. dollar was <clears throat> our currency. And in 2016, it was difficult to get cash. They were running out of cash in the country. They weren't exporting, so there was no money coming into the country. And so they came up with a brilliant idea that we would make up a money and call it bond, because they didn't want to say Zim dollars, because everyone has has their views of the Zim dollar that got to 100 trillion. So we'll psychologically call it something else. We'll call it bond. And we'll tell everyone the same it's as the US money. So now we work on this money now. It's a $2 and a $5. And this is what it means. It's like drawing a picture of a piece of chicken and saying, I've decided this is chicken and I will eat it for dinner, and it will taste the same as chicken because I said so. <laughs> so this is two US dollars, 
But of course, you can't take it outside the country because if I used it here, everyone would say, that's not a two US dollar bill. But so it can only be used in the country. Quickly, long lines began to form at the banks because they wanted to get some money. And, but again, they used up the money very quickly, faster than they could print it. And so they began to limit, you can get $30 a week out of your bank account. So uh, that means that you, can't, you, you can spend three hours to get $30. And it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. But the good news is we're a cashless society. So we're way ahead of you guys. Um, we, we use a card for everything. If you go to buy petrol, you swipe. So we are called a swiping country. If you buy at the grocery store, you swipe. Uh, even the guy on the street that sells three tomatoes has a machine that you can swipe and get your three tomatoes. So it's amazing. The government is so broke that they decided that under fives um, should be treated free and all over 65 should be given free health care because that sounds good to people and they're going to vote for us if we say that. And so they decided that, but of course they haven't given the hospitals any money to provide that care. So. I guess our government could try that here. They just say, it happens. Um, and for the last two years, we have not received a single penny from the government to help us with our expenses. And although they pay for most of our staff at the hospital and give them their money. We are supposed to get uh, $4,500 a month quarterly to provide for maternity care uh, and under fives. And we found out very quickly that sometimes there's only two quarters in a year. Sometimes there's three. <laughs> so we're not quite sure what quarterly means. Um, AIDS is uh, estimated to now be at 16.8% of the population in 2016, which is from a high of 33% in the year 2000. However, it's been predicted there's not enough money to treat all the patients in Africa that need HIV medicine, and that Africa probably has 60% uh, resistant to first-line medicine. This is a picture of one of our youth support groups. So these children were all born with AIDS, and they come every three months for a special support meeting uh, with us. Uh, our roads are not very good in Zimbabwe. I know people are complaining about the potholes in Sonoma County. This is our potholes, so I don't want to hear any complaints. <laughs> My sister-in-law would say, oh, it's rained, it's so terrible, our potholes are bad. If you bury your car in a pothole in Zimbabwe, you'll never get out again. Uh, this is our potholes, and uh, getting to town and bringing supplies is always a challenge in the vehicles. The, the saying in Zimbabwe is you can tell a drunk driver because he drives straight. <laughs> Our churches uh, have had some problems in the last two years when some people have decided they want to divide our group and become a de denominational set up with the people up on top are going to decide for the churches what they should do. I want to read again verses 6 and 7. In this greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come to you so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which persists even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Many times I ask myself, what do we have to rejoice in? I told Major, you know, I lived through the Zim dollar once. I don't think I can do that again. And it looks like we're heading that way. But you know, we have lots to be praised for. Um, God has 
kept our hospital running and thriving through difficult financial times. People look to Chittimoyle because they have heard of our good works, and even if they don't know the hospital, many people will tell them to go there for help. In Harare, there's a bus terminus called Mbari, and it's a place where people go to get a bus to go anywhere in the country. And many times we've asked our patients, you're from far away, how did you come here? And they said, if you go to Mbari and you ask somebody, I'm sick, where should I go? They will tell you, go to Chittimoyle Hospital. If they can't help you, go home and die. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not exactly true, but... <laughs> so, people come to us, and it, we live in Mashonaland West province. There's 11 provinces in the country, and we are the largest district in that province. We serve a patient population of about 330,000 people, and we are the only other hospital besides in town, in Kuroi town, there's a government hospital. So in our area, there's not much health care. We are a referral hospital for clinics that are over five hours away by truck. So if somebody goes into labor and needs a C-section in that area, they travel five hours till they get to us. AIDS at Chittimoyle has decreased to 5%, even though the country is 16.5, our general population in our area is 5%. And for women we, who are pregnant, we've decreased to 2.5% of the population, where in the year 2000, it was 22%. <laughs> this is uh, some of my kids that were born with AIDS who are on uh, medication, and they are holding up their medication. But we are proud to say that no baby has been born at Chittimoyle Hospital for the last 21 months who has been infected with AIDS. We were the first hospital in Zimbabwe to achieve that, and we hope that the end of this year it will be two years. Nobody has achieved that, but we have been able to achieve that because of God and his help. We have 62 churches, uh, as Major said, in our area, and we, um, we are responsible for those churches, Major is, and the 10 evangelists that work under him. And even though it's very difficult times in Zimbabwe, people are getting stronger in the church because of the difficulty. We just concluded our annual conference where the 62 churches come to Chittimoyle. This is the picture that you see of how crowded it is, but it, I, it reminds me of biblical times because actually we have people in the window sitting, trying to get into the church. And some of our churches are in a different language. We speak Shona in our area, but some of our churches 10 hours away speak a language called Tonga, which isn't even close to Shona. And so we have to sing and preach and translate in different languages, but the people enjoy their fellowship and time together. And they see the hope that the church has given to people through these meetings. God has used non-Christians to make us even stronger. At times we complain and say, we don't get enough support, what are we going to do, how are we going to do this? And you know what? God uses non-Christians even to help us become stronger. We work with the UK group that sponsors, sponsors rural schools in our area. They have come to us over the last 15 years that we've worked with them, and they ask us where they can build a school and develop it. And they have built five schools in our area, and we recommend to them the areas that uh, are needed to have a have an, uh, school, and we recommend where we have churches already. And they have brought water and books to these areas, and we've been able to now have a building to meet in. We also have a brand new waiting mother shelter, this is it, that was um, 
where people can come for their last month before delivery to wait in the hospital, in, in a shelter. Those are the beds that you see that they're provided. They bring their own food, their own blankets, and they cook for themselves. And they're supposed to come about a month before so that they have plenty of time to be there for a safe delivery. Some people, they like to be away from their husbands and kids for a longer amount of time, so they might come two months before. <laughs> Um, this was built by a crewing club from Seattle who chose us to build this project. They came over a period of six weeks with 15 people per week coming to build it. They put it all together. They brought it in a container and put it together. And um, they, our delivery rate has increased 40% since we now have this new waiting mother shelter. So we don't know whether we should thank them or we shouldn't thank them. Um, CDC, which is in Atlanta, and PEPFAR, which is the president's initiative for AIDS funds in Africa, uh, which was established by President Bush, has recognized our outstanding AIDS program and has paid us to have four nurses and furniture and helped given us stationery and diesel to go for our art outreach programs. And, um, and so this is paid for by your US tax dollars, so we want to thank you for that. A third doctor joined us uh, just five days before we left to come here. He's Dr. Moyo, and um, we're happy that the government recognized the need for another doctor for our hospital. I worked for nine years when I first went with no doctor at all. And so to suddenly have three doctors at our hospital has been amazing for me. I tried to convince them I could sit at home and watch TV, but they haven't fallen for that yet. <laughs> um, hospitals in the US donate lots of supplies and equipment. And I'm sure many of you have been involved with Sue and Jean Beckstead. Uh, whose garage is continually our storage room, and uh, I don't think they'll ever have an empty garage to, that they can park a car in because it has stuff. People bring things to them. They go and collect things from lots of hospitals, from St. Helena to Healdsburg to everywhere, who think of us and save equipment for us. While we were in Seattle two weeks ago, we went to a, a place called Sonic Care, and they provided two brand new ultrasound machines for us that we get to take back to Zimbabwe. And they both fit in a carry-on bag, and so when we went through Seattle Airport with two ultrasounds, they kind of looked at us very funny what our carry-on equipment was. I said, you never know when you need an ultrasound on the plane. Um, our laundry and kitchen, as most of you remember, burnt down in November 2013. And uh, we had, I had been praying for a new kitchen because ours was very old and decrepit and not safe and clean. And uh, you got to watch out what you pray for. I didn't expect God to burn the old one down, but um, he did burn it down and the government gave us the money to rebuild our kitchen. And uh, even though they have money for nothing else, they did take their promise and build our kitchen. So as you can see, we have a brand new dining room and also the kitchen on the right. And since we've been here, we've gotten the stove and two suds of pots, uh, electrical suds of pots installed and a, a hood for the stove. So we hope to be opening the kitchen officially when we get back. We are also uh, involved in two research projects with Stanford University, and through them, we've been able to prove to them that uh, org faith-based organizations have better outcomes in care than other organizations that are not faith-based. And that's been quite amazing to them. <laughs> we also have been very active in taking medical students from all over the world and teaching them third world medicine, but also as a witness to Christianity 
and having them exposed to praying with patients and praying during operations. We pray a lot during operations because sometimes we get into things we don't know what we're doing. And this year we had medical students from the US, from the UK, from New Zealand, and Poland as visitors. And then, out of the blue, about two months ago, the Japanese embassy called and said, we have a digital x-ray machine that we'd like to give to um, a hospital, are you interested? And uh, we had actually been looking into that as a project, and um, so we talked to them, and they, I said, well, let me think, yes. <laughs> and uh, so we've been working on things that they need to, we need to present to them. They've come out, they made a site visit. They, it's all gone to Japan now for them to consider, but it looks like we'll be getting a $93,000 digital x-ray, which instead of now having to do all of the big x-rays <coughs> and films, we can put it on digitally, we can print it out, just like taking a digital photograph, and it will cost our patients now $5 to get an x-ray instead of $20 which will make a big difference to us. We are told in Peter to have a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And even though we can't have hope in our governments, uh, there's no hope in our economy, we are 90% are unemployed in Zimbabwe. Try and, get a, try and get elected as a president if you have 90% unemployment rate. And we wonder how people can survive in a world without a living hope. But we are promised in 1 Peter that we are, have an inheritance that will never fail. It will never perish. It will never fade or spoil. And no matter what governments do to us, no matter what circumstances bring to our life, we have an inheritance promised to us because of Jesus Christ. We need to keep reminding ourselves that God is working out his purpose in all things. It's not easy. We grumble. You can ask Major if I grumble. I grumble very loudly. And <laughs> we all complain, but we keep reminding ourselves that joy awaits us. Uh, we need to believe and then see, not see and then believe. Um, many people in our country, before they go to traditional medical care, they seek prophets who say, you don't need to go to the hospital. I can heal you right here. They want to see, and then they'll believe. Some days it seems like our prayers only go as far as the level of the ceiling, and we all have hard times. But do we rejoice or do we grumble? Life in Zimbabwe seems to have no hope. Uh, it, we get discouraged because we need to have money to run a hospital, and we know the government is not giving us the money. So I go to Major and I tell him, I need to buy some medicine. And he'll say, how much money do you need? And I'll say, oh, how much do you think I can have? So he'll say, oh, you can have a thousand. I said, oh, okay. So I go and I order, and then I come and tell him, well, it was a little over a thousand. I think it was like 2,300 something. <laughs> and he's like, what? But you know what? God always seems to provide for us. When we need it, we get the funds, and every time we are able to provide. Sometimes we have to order at one company and then go buy some more at another company until we have enough money to pay that one off. But God <laughs> provides us that time. We are thankful for your support here for us. We couldn't survive without it. We are lucky in that we have U.S. dollars still that we can use and get things for the hospital. And you care about a country and sick people many of you have never met or seen. When we come to America, it's quite a culture shock for us. 
Um, life in America, we think, is too boring and predictable. You know, you have electricity. When you turn a light on, you have electricity. We sometimes go and turn the light on and we're like, where's the electricity? When did it go out? And then you don't know when it's coming back or what's happening. Um, we have traffic signals that you come to and they're not working on your side, but you don't know if they may be working on the other side. So you kind of go halfway in the, in the intersection. Oh, theirs is working. I better get out of here. <laughs> so it's always exciting. You never know what might happen. Um, as Major said, you come here, you have all these different choices to make. You have a whole roll of just bread. In Zimbabwe, you have brown bread or white bread. That's it. How many rows do you need for that? So we went to Seattle and we, we went out shopping and our friend said to Major, what do you want for, to eat for breakfast? So he said, I want some English muffins. So we went to a store and she's going through 10 different English muffins saying, well, this one has this much sodium. This one has this much carbs. This one has this much sugar. And he said, I don't care. I just want the muffin. <laughs> Any kind. And the more sugar, the better. <laughs> we have a game to count uh, that we count how many roadblocks between Chittimoyo and Harare, which is our main capital. It's only 250 miles, but we've gone up to 22 roadblocks in that amount of time. They try to find something wrong with your car so that they can make some money. When you send a driver to the grocery store each week, because our store is three hours one way away, so you can't take a day off from work just to go grocery shopping, it's amazing sometimes what you get. I ordered cream one day and I told him, you know, I want cream, it's in the, it's in the section next to the milk. And he came home with ice cream, because it said cream on it, and, but not in a cool box, so I got melted ice cream. And then one time I said, I want butter. And most of the time they buy margarine, so I said, it's, it says butter on it, it doesn't say margarine. And so he came home with peanut butter, because it said butter on it. One of our missionaries came from the States, you know, in the States we call Coke soda. So he said, I want 24, a case of 24 soda. So he sent his bottles in and he came back and the guy had brought in 24 boxes of baking soda. <laughs> and he said, where's my soda? And he's like, it's right there. What did you want? You ordered soda. Some of you have come here today without hope, but I have hope for you. Um, this church has hope for you, and Jesus Christ has hope for you. And we, if you are here today without hope, and you need hope, we want you to come forward and talk to the minister, talk to us, and we can tell you what real hope is. We thank you for being partners with us and helping us to have hope. Many times we get discouraged and we remember you through it. We know you are praying for us every day because we feel it. Uh, and we pray for you and for the church here because we know that you need to have hope too. And so we thank you for being so faithful to us. I first went from this church in 1972 for a year to Zimbabwe. And then I came home and became a nurse and went again in 1981. So I've been there full time since 1981. So most of my life has been spent in Zimbabwe, but I still feel lucky that I have two homes and you're the home here that we have. Many times we sit around at uh, lunch on Sunday and we'll talk about, remember when we were at Sebastopol and all the good food? He talks about all the good food um, <laughs> that we have at our potlucks or last night there were cookies after church. He was the most ecstatic person there was, cookies. And Holly packed him a go-away bag. And this morning we came, there's coffee and donuts. He was like so excited. Like I said, could you imagine how many coffee and donuts we'd have to have for our churches? But we'd have a lot more people, that's for sure. 
So thank you for always continuing to support us and encourage us. And so many of you have helped in so many ways. And many of you have come to Chitamoyo. That's a big encouragement to us. And we pray that you will continue to come. On January 21st, 2018, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Chitamoyo Christian Hospital. And we have been encouraging people to come, especially our churches that have supported us through the years. And we, are, we have some people, a lot of people that are coming. We're not quite sure where they're all going to sleep yet, but they're coming. And um, we're happy that you're sending Holly to be with us for that and represent Sebastopol Christian Church. And um, we are just excited to, ha to be able to celebrate 50 years. Many people from the government are coming and will be... Uh, celebrating with us. It will be a special church service that we will have so that we can give emphasis to praising God for the work that's been done. And the original missionary who, uh, who dedicated the hospital in 1968 will be there to preach the sermon. So we're very excited about that. And we, will have, we have some of the original dedication and we're going to use it again. So we pray that it will be a witness to many people. You should come because it's probably going to be like a four to five hour church service. <laughs> uh, not your usual American church service. <laughs> so we thank you and we continue to covet your prayers and your support and thank you for all you've done in 37 years. Thank you. <laughs>